There are several laboratory techniques that we can use with quantities and chemical reactions in order to calculate things and find out some unknowns. The first one we're going to talk about is called titration. Now, depending on the lab kit you have, you may have an Erlenmeyer flask going is going to get. And in that Erlenmeyer flask, you would put some volume of an unknown acid. So this is going to be, say, I don't know, 15 milliliters of HCl, but we don't know its concentration. Then we're going to put in a couple of drops of an indicator. So an indicator is a weak organic acid that is one color in an acidic environment and another color in a basic environment. So then that gets all swirled around. Then we're going to set up what's called a burette. Now this is what we set up in the laboratory. For the home lab, what we use is typically a uh, syringe. So a burette is like a really large syringe and it is graduated, so we can tell exactly what volume we have in our burette. And in the burette goes a standardized sodium hydroxide in this particular example. Usually titrations do occur with acids and bases. So if I say in my burette I have 0 0.500 molar NaOH. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this into my acid solution. Remember there's a there's an indicator in there until I get a color change. Now that color change will show us what's called the end point. It could also be called the equivalence point. Now we're not going to worry too much about this right now, but what that means is the moles of my acid are equal to the moles of my base. Now because this burette is so well calibrated and I took a very careful initial reading, now I can take my final volume reading and I know exactly how much of this calibrated sodium hydroxide I have used. So whenever you have a titration reaction or a problem where you're going to need to calculate, the first thing you should do is identify what your two substances are that are reacting together. Most of the time with a titration, it's going to be an acid and a base. Now an acid-base neutralization reaction, and that's what this is called, will always form water and a salt. Salt is a chemical word and it is not necessarily what you're going to put on your food at the dinner table. In this case, our salt is sodium chloride, which is what you put on your food at the dinner table. Now a salt is the cation of the base here and the anion of the acid. This is a double displacement reaction. You see we, we move the H comes and knocks the sodium out of the way. The sodium comes, it takes the place of the hydrogen. So this is a double displacement reaction that will always result in water and a salt. That's the general acid-base neutralization reaction. For this particular acid-base neutralization reaction, this is a balanced equation. Now if in my problem I tell you that we used 22 0.6 milliliters of this sodium hydroxide in order to reach the end point for a 15 milliliter sample or aliquot of acid, what was the original concentration of my acid? Well, we're going to start with the volume of the base, and I'm going to convert that into liters just automatically. Make sure when you're writing these things out that you do put your compound name, because liters of sodium hydroxide can only cancel out liters of sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to convert this to moles by using molarity. Remember the definition of molarity is that it is moles of your solute over liters of solution. So because my liters of sodium hydroxide cancel out, now I have moles of sodium hydroxide. I'm not going to then use the stoichiometric coefficients here. Remember the absence of a number is one, it is not a zero. So I have one mole of sodium hydroxide and that will be reacting with one mole 
of hydrochloric acid. Now when I perform this arithmetic, 0 0.0226 liters time, or excuse me, 0 0.0226 times 0 0.500, we have times one divided by one. Then I have 0 0.0113 moles of HCl at my endpoint. So now I can find the original molarity. Remember capital M molarity is equal to moles over liters. So I have my moles, 0 0.0113, and I have the volume of HCl. That was given to me initially. I had a 15 milliliter aliquot or sample. So I convert that into liters. And I get a value of 0 0.753. I'm going to double check my sig figs. I have four sig figs here. I only have two sig figs here and here. So I can only uh, finish with three sig figs. I may have just said two sig figs there. There's three significant digits. So I need to end with three significant digits. The digit after this three is another three. It repeats. So this is 0 0.753 three molar HCl. That was the concentration we started with. Let's do another titration problem. This time we're going to do a titration of 10.0 milliliters of sulfur. And it, that 10.0 milliliters of sulfuric acid is going to require 12.50 milliliters of a 0.812 capital M molar sodium hydroxide solution to reach the end point. What is the original acid concentration? First thing you should do is write out that acid neutralization reaction. So we start with our sulfuric acid and we add sodium hydroxide to it. That will react to form water and our salt. The base and the anion of the acid. Remember this SO4, this sulfate, is a 2 minus. That's one of our polyatomic anions. Now we have to balance our equation. So I have two sodiums over here, so I'm pretty sure I need to put a 2 here. Count the rest of our atoms. I'm going to need a 2 in front of the water as well. So now we have a balanced chemical equation. And now I can get started. I'm going to start with the volume of my base. I'm going to convert that into liters just on the fly. And then I need to calculate how many moles that is. So I will use the molarity, 0 0.812 moles of sodium hydroxide in one liter of sodium hydroxide. Now I use the stoichiometric ratio found in the balanced chemical equation. So I need moles of sodium hydroxide and I'm going to convert that into moles of sulfuric acid. Remember the absence of a number is a one, not a zero. So in order to find the concentration, the original concentration of my sulfuric acid, I need to know the moles of my uh, sulfuric acid. So I take 0 0.0125, multiply it by 0.812, and then divide that by 2. And I get 5.075 times 10 to the negative 3, and that's moles of my sulfuric acid. Looks like I'm running off the screen here, H2SO4. So now I use the definition of molarity. So I have 5.075 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. And I'm not rounding here intentionally, SO4. And I'm going to then divide it by the original volume. So 10 milliliters, but convert it to liters. So when I divide that out, then I have my original molarity, 0 0.5075, capital M molarity HCl. I only had three significant digits here. I have three significant digits here. So I can only report three significant digits. Look next door. 
0.508 capital M molarity. That was, and I put HCl, this is H2SO4. That was the original concentration of my acid. The next laboratory technique where we can use calculations is called a gravimetric analysis. Really a gravimetric analysis is anything where you're weighing stuff. So this could be uh, a precipitation reaction where you react two aqueous compounds and then you get the precipitate and then you take a mass of it and you can calculate off of that mass. It could be a physical process where uh, you, say, evaporate the water off of a salt water solution in order to find out how much salt was in it. So this could be physical or this could be chemical. Now I'm going to go over one or two examples here uh, to give you an idea of how some of these things could be worded. So for example, if you're given a problem, what is the percent of chloride ion in a sample? And that sample has a mass of 1.1324 grams. If that sample produces 1.0881 grams of sodium chloride when it is reacted with an excess of silver. Well, we know that silver ions plus the chloride ions react to form what we're calling so far the insoluble silver chloride. So we have this original sample, and here we're making 1.0881 grams of silver chloride. Well, remember 99% of the time in here, you see uh, grams, you're going to need to convert it to moles. So that's a good place to start. So I'm going to convert this 1.0881 grams of silver chloride into moles of silver chloride. But what I'm aiming for is actually how much chloride reacted. So I have my 1.088 grams of silver chloride and I'm going to use the formula mass of silver chloride. Remember formula mass is uh, calculated by looking at the periodic table and adding up the constituent elements. So here that is the mass of one mole of silver chloride. In one mole of silver chloride, I have one mole of chloride anions but I need the mass because I don't know how many moles of my original sample I had. I don't know what it is. So I need the atomic mass of chlorine, so 35.45 grams for one mole, in order to find the mass of the chloride that I must have reacted. And I get 0 0.269 grams of chloride that was reacted. Now, I actually left that in my calculator. There, there are more uh, digits there. So 26914, I think, would be appropriate. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, that would be more appropriate. Five significant digits. So this is my grams of chloride. And I'm going to put use that as a ratio with my original sample mass, 1.1324 grams of my sample in order to find out what percentage of that sample was chloride anion. Then I'm going to multiply that by 100. And what I get is 23.76% of my sample by mass was chloride anion. Another laboratory technique where we can use quantities in our chemical reaction is combustion analysis. Now combustion is literally the burning up. And when we perform a combustion analysis, a lot of times what we're doing is we're using something like a hydrocarbon. And we're burning it in a controlled environment with an excess of oxygen water. Now, in this combustion environment, in, in the combustion chamber, this is a very controlled reaction. And it is a precise measurement that, that occurs. So if we have a hydrocarbon, and a hydrocarbon only consists of carbon and hydrogen, and we have a sample that's, say, 0 0.00215 grams. And we are asked to find the empirical formula based on combustion data. We're told we have 0 0.00726 grams of carbon dioxide produced, and we have 0 0.00148 grams of water produced.
Now, I don't know these numbers, so I can't just do a straight stoichiometric analysis looking at how those uh, molar moles are related to one another. But what I can do is say all of the carbon from the hydrocarbon becomes carbon in carbon dioxide, and all of the hydrogen becomes hydrogen in water. So I can use these values to find out how many moles of each of those elements I had to begin with. So I take my grams of carbon dioxide and I use the molar mass in order to convert them into moles of carbon dioxide. I will then take my, my moles of compound and using the subscript of my chemical formula, I can convert it to constituent atom or element. So doing this arithmetic, I have 1.65 times 10 to the negative four moles of carbon. Now for the water, I perform a similar analysis using the formula mass of water. This time in my one mole of water, I have two moles of hydrogen. And I get 1.64 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of hydrogen. Now because these two values are so very close to one another, we can say that there's a 1 to 1 ratio. And because we can say that, the empirical formula of this hydrocarbon is CH. Now we can perform combustion analysis on other compounds as well. For example, if we have 0.025 grams of a boron hydrogen compound, and we're told we have a molecular mass that's about 28 AMU. From the combustion analysis, we find that there are 0.063 grams of B2O3 produced when burned in air. So what are the empirical formulas and the molecular formulas? Well, here I have a gram mass and I'm told what the compound is. So let's convert that into moles. So I need the molar mass of B2O3. So one mole of B2O3 has a mass of 69.617 grams. And I know all of the boron from my original compound turned into this compound. And so I have one mole of my compound has two moles of boron. So I have 0 0.0018, I'm going to round that, uh, that would be 181. I'm going to leave that there, and that would be moles of boron. Now the hydrogen was not controlled. So in order to find out what mass of hydrogen I have, I'm gonna need to take this uh, molar amount of boron, which I left in my calculator, I had several more digits. I had 0 0.0018099, et cetera. So I left that in my calculator and I converted that into grams by using the atomic mass of boron, which is 10.81. I got 0 0.01956, oops, I just realized I am off the page, 0 0.01956 grams of boron. So now I need to go back to my original sample. So my original sample is made up of a mass of boron and a mass of hydrogen. So if I subtract from my original sample my mass of boron, and I'm actually going to keep these digits, even though uh, significant figure-wise, that wouldn't work because I don't want to introduce additional rounding error. So what I get here is 5.44 times 10 to the negative 3, and this is grams of hydrogen now. So I can take that mass of hydrogen and convert it into moles. So one mole of hydrogen is 1.01 grams. And so I get a mole value of 5.3 and 
uh, let's see, did I round? I rounded here. I get 5.39. And I'm going to round that. 5.4 times 10 to the negative 3, and that's moles of hydrogen. So now I can create my pseudo empirical formula. And I'm just going to use these molar values here. So my moles of boron, my moles of hydrogen. So I have 0 0.0018, I have 0 0.0054. I divide them both by the smaller one, so something ends up being 1. And I get a nice clean BH3. So that is my empirical formula. Now the uh, empirical molar mass, so I have boron, which is 10.8. I'm just going to round that to 11. So I have 11 plus 3. The empirical molar mass is about 14 AMU. I'm told the molecular formula was 28 AMU. So I must need to multiply these subscripts by 2. So B2H6 is the molecular formula from this combustion analysis.